Well, thanks for the opportunity. I'm very delighted to be here and um, talk to you. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so we had uh, this morning, we had a very interesting, a series of interesting talks on different topics related to water, energy, and food. And um, most of those talk, talk about the more in general at the state level, at the national level. So what, what I'm going to talk to you is about some of the new technology that are coming or currently available at the farm level. And, um, and talk to, about how those technology can, can help us to, um, to save these resources and take, uh, utilize these resources much better. So, um, so this is something we, uh, we kind of discussed this morning about can we feed the world? As you know, that uh, by 2050, uh, we need to, produce, to increase uh, our food productions. Um, we had an additional 2.3 billion people, and, and um, that increases the, uh, the amount of food that we need to, to produce. Our water shortage is a topic that I discussed this morning. Um, farmers need more, more water. In fact, while we are still have a problem using existing water, we, have to, we need more water by 2030 to, to, to meet the demands. Also. Um, yeah, at the same time, we are losing land to urbanization and, and a spread of plant and animal diseases. This is another issue, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit during my talk. Um, so, so what we really need is, of course, uh, we have to increase our production while we're maintaining a sustainable production system and, um, and try to reach the potential yield. Of, um, this. So... Um, these are, uh, if you look at the FAO, these are the things you see in, in the, in the uh, expectation that what's going to happen. At the same time, we, we, talk, we heard about, um, like Dr. Porter this morning mentioned about the LEDs technology and, and so, how human ingenuity can, cha can change all these predictions. And, and we turn out that we may be wrong um, on all these predictions. And, um, and, and so during what I'm going to show you that now is that some of this new technology that's coming up in the production side that has a lot of potential um, for, for making those changes. So um, at the farm level, I, I, uh, I think that we can increase uh, innovation agriculture is currently happening in, in, in four main categories, in, in my view. One is um, cost-effective rugged sensors for collecting data in the field. So the way... Um, the way the current technologies go is that it's mainly data driven. And, and that's what we are trying to, to do is to talk about collecting more information and, and increase our efficiency using information based management techniques. Um, uh, then we also have the uh, semi and fully automated autonomous ground and, and aerial vehicle. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and how it's going to affect the productions. Um, <laughs> Innovative data communications and, and, and hardware and software to, uh, to, uh, to utilize the, those data to make it into a ma better management decisions and, and help the grower to make a better uh, production. And at and, uh, and the end, uh, innovative environmentally friendly practices that has resulted as uh, those new technologies. So, um, so um, one of the things that uh, we, we we here, I'm going to start with the machines, uh, tractors, equipment in the field, and talk a little bit about that and, and w explain what's, what's the new technology coming and, and how that affects all these things. So, y you know, um, manufacturers are right, consistently working on improving their equipment, They're improving their machine, increasing the fuel efficiency, um, decreasing the pollution, and, and decreasing the breakdowns of those machines. But among those technologies that are coming up, one technology specifically, in my view, is, uh, is making a very, very important uh, changes. And that's what we call it the um, CAN bus. So, so can, what is CAN bus? CAN is basically inside the tractors, there are several computers. In fact, tractors are more complicated than most people think. There are several computers that control the engines, control the transmissions, and control the uh, other steering system and, and also the impediment. So this CAN, CAN system is a communication protocol that allows these different computers start to talk to each other at the same time. So, 
So uh, with, the, with this, this standard bus, now uh, every time you connect a tractor to an implement, the tractor automatically recognizes what implement is connected to it and try to adjust its uh, settings that is most appropriate for it. For example, so if you connecting a, um, a planter to your equipment, it quickly recognizes what kind of planter it is, what's the setting is, and, and, and start to um, doing very interesting things with it. For example, in the past, when you are, when you are planting and you are turning a curve, um, you are putting the same amount of seed. But the, the, the planter, the unit that is far out to the curve, it, 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 it should put more because it, it cover more ground. The, so this, this new system, now it recognizes that and, and try to compensate for it. So it means that you have a better uniformity in your system. But this is not just limiting to that. It, it also brought up a very, very interesting new thing, and I just heard about it, um, that a lot of time now, the implement control the tractor. Not, it's currently, the, it's the other way. The tractor pulls the implement, and it goes with whatever speed they want. Now, in the future, the, the implement actually, and this is not the future, it's a currently new, new plant that has the capability, that they can control the tractor. It means tell the tractor how fast I want you to go. So that I, so tractor is basically follow the order of the planter. So if you are plowing, for example, so the, it measures the forces on the, on the mobile plow and decides how fast it has to go so that it does the best job while we doing this. So this kind of technology is, is very interesting. At the same time, and that's, it collects all those information. It, it, it tells you how fast, what's the engine's RPM is, how fast it goes, where it is in the field, uh, how many seed per acre it puts. And, and all this data is not going to be stored or disregarded. In the, all this data actually goes to, uh, to a central location that farmers have access to it, dealers have access to it, and they can determine if this tractor is utilized correctly or at optimal productivity. Um, at the same time, if, for example, the amount of seed is reducing in the, uh, in the bin, it, it triggers a signal to, a, to another person that brings more seed. I'm, I'm going to run out of this. Meet me at this point in the field. So all these things, it enables us to do a more efficient job. And, and that's, that's what's right now happening at the, at the field and at the machinery level. So the machines are becoming a lot more smarter and, and they are um, increasing our efficiency of that. And so that, this, this could uh, uh, result in, in better yield and improve our yield and also improve our resources. So another example is an uh, auto steering system because they are so accurate. These are the system that uh, steer the tractor in the field in a series of parallel lines. And uh, because the accuracy is about half, half an inch or so, so the guess um, the guess rows are very accurate. In the past, guess rows could be, uh, you know, a lot of variability there. Now, with this technology, they are very, very accurate. So, so the, the point I want to make is that data is going to play an important role in increasing the efficiency of the equipment. Um, so um, this is the slide that I borrowed from our colleagues. Um, it shows the flow of information from field to product. To product. So let's start with the... Uh, First on the, uh, says on field management. So the first step in when we are trying to plant is um, to prepare the soil, right? So we need to have information about, about the soil. We need to know the variability of soil, physical and chemical properties, how much nitrogen, and a special variability, how much nitrogen, phosphor, potassium, soil organic matter, and so on is there. So, these are, there are sensors and equipment uh, that is available right now or, or at the production right now that enable us to, to collect all this information. We know variability in soil type. We know which part is uh, um, compacted or not. Um, next step is um, planting. And, and the, again, these sensors enable us to collect information about field records. Um, what kind of irrigation system we use, uh, how much fertilizer we put in the field, um, how many material we sprayed, at what location, at what concentrations, 
um, size, color, etc. And and then when we get to harvesting, again we 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 know how much yield we have, um, and um, and even information about the quality of the for har material we harvested. Um, and then then it goes to the post harvest. It means the grading. So if if it for example if you are harvesting fruit, we can um, we can now see what was the average size, what was the quality, what was the sugar content, what was the acidity, um, and so on. And at the same time, all this information at the production level can then go along with the, at the distribution level, and, and then it can go at the consumption level. So uh, the consumer now can, can get all this information. And so all this, th this information can be useful. So I'm going to go through this, some of this technology and explain a little bit and, and then and, and show you how, how they can be very beneficial to us. So I'm starting with the yield monitor because this is, was the, the, the first probably sensors that was developed back in late 80s. Um, so um, they engineer does design this uh, mass flow sensor that they put on a grain combine and they were able to actually quantify the amount of grain that goes through the combine harvester as they go through the field. And they were able to, to create a map, and combining that with the GPS, they were able to combine that and, and create a map we call it the yield map. So, so yield map was a very interesting map when, when, when we uh, first created it. Um, not that farmers didn't know about it. Farmers always knew that there is a yield variability in the field. One thing they didn't know was that what's the extent, and they never quantified that. Now, yield monitor was able to quantify the amount of yield variability. Um, which was very exciting uh, back then. But th then um, it causes an issue which says, okay, that's interesting to know that I have a high yield here and low yield there, but the question is, um, what causes it and what can I do about it? And that turns out to be a, a more challenging question because in order to understand what causes it, then you have to have more data, more information, and understanding why, why yield is low here. Is that enough nutrient there? Was there enough moisture there and so on? Was there seed there at all? Um, so um, that, that was one issue with the yield monitoring when it started. The second one is that you get this yield data after season is over. It means it's good information, but season already over and I can't do anything about it. So what we really want, we want something that can tell us about this early in the season because the cause of yield variability, there are two types, either manageable or is not manageable. So if it's a manageable, then we would like to do something about it. And, and that's where the yield estimation came. And it turns out that yield estimation is actually more useful for growers in terms of if I can predict what the yield is going to be, it's really helpful because if I can understand what the causes of it, I can do something about it. So what's happening right now is that we have lots of good crop models. There are lots of good crop models that if you know the given environmental factor, it can predict the yield fairly good, um, especially for certain, like wheat or for corn and no. So, um, so now that we have a yield monitor, what we really need is to, ha to have a good way of measuring all those environmental factors. If we have the, all the input that goes to that model, if we can measure it at the field level, at the larger scale, then we can predict the yield fairly good and then uh, we can see if we can do something about it. So, so that requires that we have more sensor. And, and that's what we get. We need soil sensor. We need sensor that can measure soil moisture content. And it's not just a one point measurement. We need to, if you have 10,000 acres, you need to imagine how many sensor, what you need to have in order to calculate all those variability in the soil. And also, all other things, and you know, agriculture is complicated. It's not just one factor. It's a series of factors that sometimes uh, very hard to measure. Uh, so there are been, has been a lot of uh, work on developing soil sensors and sensors that can measure factors related to the soil. At the same time, there were some sensors that measure factors related to the plant, disease, um, um, nutrient deficiency, and so on. And all these, a lot of these sensors are optical sensors means they are uh, measuring um, spectral characteristic of plant and then try to relate that to that 
what could cause that change in the spectral characteristic, and from that figure out what's going on. So, um, for example, um, this this one is like an imaging sensor. This is what you start to see a lot more and hear about it. These are the um, so these are these cameras, the special cameras. Like you can see, there are six lens in front, and it, there is a filter in front of it. So this particular one, we were using it for detecting citrus greening. It's a disease for citrus. So we find out, for example, what is the spectral characteristics of the citrus greening, and then we try to narrow it down to a certain bands, and then we selected filters. Uh, the filters that only allow a specific band can go through it. And then, so this filter, we put it in front of camera, and then using those six bands, we were able to, to see if we can detect the, the greening. So, so this is also applied for other crops and for other diseases as well. But the concept is, is this, basically. Um, other kind of sensor is the sensors that measure kind of precise volume and density and and uh, as I said, there's a um, like example that here is a laser that measures the kind of tree size volume. And, and we were trying to use that. For example, for tree crops, um, the amount of nutrient is proportional to the size of a tree. So if you have a larger tree, you need to put more. If you have a smaller, you need to put less fertilizer. So if we can somehow measure it, then we can somehow automate this system and, and uh, make the fertilizer spreader more uh, more smart, putting the right amount at the right location. And then there are um, a new group of sensors that come in that are called biomarker-based detection. And these, um, these are based on the, um, um, they are looking at the special, um, like, a, like an artificial nose. It's just look, try to detect a specific uh, chemical that release as a result of the uh, insect or disease. And, if they can detect that at the very low concentration, they can relate that to that specific disease and figure out what it is. So all these sensors also um, need some sort of a platform. And, and you will see that the, uh, there are a lot of in, in innovation is happening at this level. So uh, for example, what you see here, the, the black box, look a black box is actually um, a robot. We are building it for strawberry. So this supposed to go on top of a strawberry rose and look for a sign of disease and, uh, and try to detect the yield, basically estimate the yield and detect the, um, any diseases. And this is, again, is a project in progress. But we also have a, um, two other things that are happening. It's an um, autonomous uh, ground-based vehicle, which tractor could be also one of them, and then aerial ground-based system. So I'm going to start with the ground-based system. So this, this one, this video, as you can see, this is about 15 years old video. And uh, it shows that um, you know, John Deere built this autonomous tractor back in 2000. So they had already this technology that um, they were able to actually go through the rows. So you, you don't need any operator. It goes through the field. Um, then, then back in 2008, we also got a grant. Uh, with John Deere and Carnegie Mellon and, and so other, try to build a series of the tractor that collaboratively work together and, and do the field, actual field operation. This particular, there is a person sitting on it that actually the tractor is autonomous. Um, just to safety, we need to put somebody there. Um, so this project is, um, went ahead and in fact, from the technology point of view, John Deere already have the capability to build autonomous tractor that can can do all the field operations. So there are advantages to have, a, well, why do we need autonomous tractor? Because tractor can work 24 hours for you. Then you don't need an operator, it, and it can do spray at night, because spraying at night is a lot better than spraying during the day. So there are a lot of ad advantage of having a, an autonomous tractor. But why don't we see that? And in fact, at the end of this, still John Deere doesn't want to market this, although they have the technology. So why they don't want to do that? Because of liability. I mean, they are concerned that in case something goes wrong, they don't want to be liable. So last month, I heard about this. Um, a, a small unknown company uh, called Autonomous Tractor Corporation in North Dakota 
for the first time marketed the first autonomous tractor in the market. You can actually go and buy this tractor, fully autonomous. Um, there's an interesting features about this tractor. Um, they're building tractors about 100 to 400 horsepower tractor. Um, they have their own navigation system and they, they are start selling these tractors. Um, well, it sounds like this company may not be so concerned about liability because it's such a small company and um, they may be able to, to pull this off. But the advantage of a company like this to, produce, to market something like that is that um, they kind of force the other manufacturer to come to the market as well. And, and interestingly, is the price of this is not much higher than a regular tractor. So a 100 horsepower tractor, autonomous horse tractor, uh, 100 horsepower autonomous tractor costs around $50,000, which is in a ballpark of similar tractor at horse, 100 horsepower. And plus, plus a lot of interesting other features that comes with this. So this, um, this is an example of a technology that can potentially um, changes the way we operate and utilize equipment in the field. Another interesting topic that is, you start to hear a lot about it recently is the, is the um, a small unmanned vehicle. And, 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 and the reason for this is that, as you probably heard, the FAA um, is going to open a US airspace to commercial use of a small UAV. And it turns out that agriculture is going to be the biggest market for this. Uh, and as a result of that, there is a huge number of companies that start building these this small UAVs for, uh, for use in agriculture. Um, so um, we started working with this back in 2005, 2008, 2009, because that was the time we had the greening problem in Florida. And we were trying to find, back then we were trying to detect the disease. So that disease is much easier to detect from the air. If you, if you look at the, uh, the symptoms are easier to see from the air. So we were, um, we were trying to use that. And um, while we got into it from the disease point of view, we start to see that there are interesting use for this. And so this is a, this is a fixed wing. Um, I probably uh, you start to see um, a video that shows, you know, these are uh, fairly low cost. They, they can, you know, throw it by hand and, and, and take an aerial image of your field. So it, it's, um, it, it, these are, as you can see, the orange grove in Florida. And we were collecting data for, for a different purpose. So it, it goes, um, it flies over, as I said, with the autonomous. There will be a, there will be a um, pilot sitting there just basically watching it and it will take over in case there is a problem but as you see it just fly on, on its own on a predetermined path it just go back and forth and take aerial image um, so um, but so so what what's the use of it and why why we think this is such interesting technology because um, there are a lot of things we can do with this not that we couldn't do this before we could have always used this technology using um, satellite or manned airplane, the problem was that the cost. Back then it was, I mean, still it cost a lot to, to have a manned airplane to fly and collect those information, whereas small UAV costs are very little. And plus, you have the chance to do it when you want to do it. And a lot of time in agriculture, we have a small window of opportunity that we need to fly at a very short time, and this allows us to do that. So, so the use of this, what can be used for we divided this to two categories, active and, and passive. So passive is using it for disease and stress detection, monitoring crop growth, yield estimation, um, um, assessing herbicide efficiency, optimizing nutrient, water management. And an active one is uh, chasing bird. This one is for blueberry growers. That's what they like to do. It they just they think that's a useful application for it or, or chemical application. So, uh, so again, some of these uh, things are nothing new. We remote sensing been around for a long time, but one thing that the UAV allows to do is to co collect image at a very, very high resolution, and and the high resolution means a lot in in disease detection for tree crop. Uh, so, so this one, uh, the one you see on the left, is a false color. 
what you see as red is actually near infrared. So our eyes really cannot see that. That's why they, they use a red in that. And then we can calculate the uh, NDVI, uh, which is a vegetative index. And, and that will tell us something about the stress in the tree. So um, what you see as a darker green is actually healthier canopy. And, and the, uh, the trees that are um, declining are less green. Plus, you can also quantify the, the weed between these, and, and those are other applications. Um, so, but, oh, okay, as I said, the, all these things have been around, and, and it's not really a new technology. But what is going to change is that we, um, what's really valuable for growers is if we can do something with this that they cannot do it on their own. So, for example, this, this is like about 100 uh, plants in this. 12 of them are water stressed, slightly water stressed. And if you show this to anybody, there's no way they can tell you which, which one are water stressed. But if you take a thermal image, and you can see those 12 shows up. And, and th these are the value of this technology that it enables you to do things that human cannot do. And that's, that's very really, really valuable for growers. Another application is uh, inventory management, being able to uh, to know how many, this is a, actually a citrus, uh, I'm sorry, Christmas tree uh, field in, in uh, this is in Oregon. And the growers wants to know how many trees they have. And it's interesting if they don't even know how many trees they have, they just plant. And, and they want to know how many trees they have and, and, and what is the probably quality of that. Um, this is another uh, field, it's an inventory management open field nursery. Um, this is interesting because this is a big, big problem for nursery growers is that um, they, um, they plant, uh, they put these pots and they grow them. And first they put in a row and column. So it's very easy to count at the beginning. But then they partially harvest, means they remove the good ones. And then they end up uh, having uh, something like this that is half of it gone. And now if you try to count this, it's very, very difficult. And, and to send somebody to count this, it takes time and it's very time consuming. Whereas you can do this from air, uh, just take an aerial image and have a software to do this. Uh, even uh, we develop a software that can actually count overlapping canopy, which means with the overlapping canopy, in fact, human cannot count. So that, that's another advantage, that you can do something that human cannot do. Um, this one. Uh, is an example of the uh, um, uh, a system for um, pest uh, insect detection and insect map, uh, pest pressure mapping. Uh, this was a quick test. We were trying to see if we can really detect ciliate um, with, with the aerial image. And so, so as you can see, it flies over and, and takes images uh, from these uh, sticky traps. Um, and, and then you can see that as it flies, it takes picture. You can see the pictures on it. Um, so it, these are very, very high resolution pictures. So you can actually zoom in and, and see uh, uh, very details on it. Unfortunately, the, these cities are so small. It's like two millimeter length. So um, it's very hard even with the high resolution to count on that. But what we were able to do is that we were able to actually create a map and, and, and show that there is a border effect. That's, what, that, that's something that entomologists always told us that this comes from, from the border. And, and there is high concentration is around the border. And in fact, we saw the same thing. And so what can be used is this time type of map is that you can use it to actually do your sprayer based on that. So if, if you get more uh, silly around the border, you can spray them more often than, than the center part. But here is, the, here is the other interesting things that, as I said, this technology evolved. You can do very, very interesting things. One of them is that there are software that are commercially available that allow you to, to take a 2D image and convert it to a 3D image because, because they, the way you fly and take consecutive pictures. Um, so this is actually an orange grove that you can see we uh, we can see the size and volume of the trees here. So, so what's the use of it? What's good to know that what's the size and volume? Well, this has a very direct use for yield estimation. 
the, the, in, in citrus tree, the larger the tree is, you get more yield. So having also a map of variability also very, very useful. Um, another one is, um, for research, this is a, a nematode in a strawberry field. And um, uh, there we had a colleagues who were trying to um, study the con uh, some chemicals alternative to methyl bromide. As you know, methyl bromide is phased out, and they are looking for alternative to it. And they were doing these plots. Uh, they're putting different concentration of different chemicals, and they try to see which one is more effective. Well, it's a lot of labor and to go and quantify that from the ground base, but from the air is, is much easier and, and, and faster to do. Uh, but this is, a, this is a new thing. I, I was in Germany two weeks ago attending a trade show, and, and, and this, uh, uh, as I expected, there was a bunch of you know, companies who offer UAV, but this one was um, a UAV that has a gadget underneath, and I was curious to see what it is. It turns out that this was actually a drop release device that attached to a multi-rotor UAV to, um, for biological control of corn borer. So they dropped this uh, pallet that has uh, this wasp, which is a natural um, enemy of that uh, corn borer. And they try to use the biological control uh, for, for that. And they are using UAV to do that. So there are a lot of more examples of the uh, UAV in agriculture. But, um, um, and, and I don't want to go through all of them, but you start to hear a lot more about it. But one thing I want to say is that with all this new technology, then um, we, we introduce the technology to the growers, and they take it, and take it to the, the innovative growers, take it to, an, to a very next level. For example, this is the other steering system um, been in the market for the last 15 years or so. Um, this is a picture from a, a very innovative grower in Iowa. That um, so the, he used this uh, technology. So auto steering is basically out, uh, steer the tractor in a straight line throughout the field and, and, and allow you to do these operations. But he started to use it in a very very interesting way. One of them was, um, you know, we had something called a strip till. It means you you tilt the tree uh, the field in a very na in a na narrow street in uh, in uh, a narrow strip in. Um, in fall, and then in, in, in um, spring, you go back and plant right on the top of the pl places that you, you till. Well, without the other steering technology, this was a very, very difficult part because you could not figure out where was those tilt bands. But with the other steering system, it's very easy, and you can go back and tilt on this. So the, the advantage of this is that you save a lot of energy uh, because you only, you only tilt a narrow band, not the whole field. And this is very common now in Europe. They are using this a lot. Other one is the concept of, con they call it controlled traffic. The idea was that you only drive on a certain path through the field so that you don't compact the soil so that you don't reduce your yield. So the idea was that you select your map, your, uh, your, uh, your uh, implement, so that they always go on the same path. So you, for example, you're spraying, you're planting, you're spraying, and then your harvest, they all go on the same path. Again, this technology would not be possible without the steering technology. But now you can do this with other string very easily. Uh, this is another example, the inter-row planting of corn and soybean. You know, they, um, they usually ro they have a rotation of corn and soybean in the Midwest. This idea is that they just do a band of corn, a band of soybean, and then they, uh, they, ro they change that. What's the advantage of it is that the corn, the boundary light one, because they get more sunlight, you get more yield. So this way you can get a lot more yield if you use this kind of technology. Again, th this required that you have to drive it very, very accurately, and that it's not possible with other, st other steering technology. Um, another thing, and this is something we are doing, a heat treatment. This is a machine that we use to... to um, to treat the HLB infected trees, not completely treat them, but to kill the bacteria. So we cover the tree, we inject the steam, and, and so on. So what is I'm trying to get with this is that a lot of time we are focused on chemical control, and we totally ignored physical control. Now this, this technology allows us now to 
to look at the physical control by changing the physical condition. Like imagine if you spray a leaf with certain material that it's so slippery that uh, insect cannot sit on it, they sleep, then they can eat on it, right? So th these are the new concept that is evolving and coming into the market. So um, to, co to conclude my talk, I just want to say that um, uh, we can always improve our uh, efficiency of our operations in the field, and the technology can really help us to do that. Uh, there is economical, environmental, logical reason for that, and, and information-based management technique is, is really can help us to, to reach that goal. Obviously, um, uh, economics of it need to be in, considered because that's always the factor that growers uh, ask. Any time you come up with a new technology, they would they ask you how much. I mean, and and that's that's one thing we also need to think about that. Um, so. Um, there are opportunity for us in terms of um, using the information for managing decision. And, and the good thing is that this tech kind of technology, especially the one I mentioned about UAV, and any kind of growers can benefit from it. This is small or large growers, they can benefit from it. And of course, there are challenges that um, every time we build a sensor, uh, we are dealing with the um, fact that it has to be robust, it has to be Reliable at the same time should be cheap. You know they that they want them all, and um, that's not always possible. Um, so um, with this, I just start to um, conclude my talk and I'll open up for any question you might have.